So I'm glad the clarification was made up front that this was Dr. Seabag's talk. I will confess to the fact that this is something that I'm still having an evolving knowledge of as well, not having a lot of personal experience. So um, I'm kind of hoping that it will take the full time and that there will sadly not be time for questions. Um, <laughs> There's lots of uh, great puns that are out there in the literature right now about cars. So I saw one recently, can we afford this car? And it was talking about the price of T-cell therapy, so I had to come up with my own. But I won't just be talking about CAR T-cells, also the conjugated BCMA monoclonal anti antibody, but both have to do with BCMA. And uh, sorry to disappoint you, that is not British Columbia marijuana access. It's something quite different. Does this work? Oh, there we go. No, I'm good. Um, so, saw that yesterday. Um, so, the uh, T cells we already talked about, so I'm not going to go through this much because that was just beautifully covered. Um, but it's a type of white blood cell <coughs> that um, migrates to and forms at something called the thymus gland, which is in the neck. And these are, as aforementioned, are soldiers, and they basically kind of hone in and they are very targeted in their attacks. So, they, they target very specific enemies in your body. And there's two types of T cells. There's helper T cells. And remember we talked yesterday about the B cells and the T cells that come alongside and help them to grow and proliferate and, and become what they need to be. Those are the helper T cells. But the ones we're talking about today are cytotoxic T cells. And they go in and they will actually destroy something that shouldn't be there. Um, and the other thing we're going to talk a little bit about, again, has already been, been touched on, is the antibodies. And we've talked a fair bit about those over the last couple of days, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. But again, they're very, very specific. They target very specific enemies, very specific antigens, bacteria, viruses, cancer cells that help to destroy them. So you can see here that there's a lot of actual components of how cancer cells can be attacked. So there's these natural killer cells, which actually don't have the same learning curve that T cells do, but can, are kind of similar to them and can also attack cancer cells. There's these macrophages, which can be involved. You can see them, the green squiggly ones, um, the cytotoxic T cells, and then antibodies that are directly in the circulation, all of which can have a role in targeting the cancer. So how does this work? Um, the activated cy cytotoxic T cells, they can actually kill potential cancer cells. So there's the evil myeloma cell that has come in. Not so happy anymore. He doesn't like this guy. There. Kills the cancer cells. So I, this is a potential cancer cell that has now been eliminated. Remember Dr. McHale yesterday said, best is if these cancer cells can never grow in the first place. So these cells are kind of, they're like the beat cops. They're kind of st cruising around trying to find these, these before they become an issue. Now, cancer cells, however, can develop resistance, as was just uh, referred to in the, in the last presentation. They can become resistant. They're tricky. They're smart. And so, oh, you can't get any, you know, you can't get any headway with this. And so then the cancer cells can actually start to grow and proliferate and be there where they shouldn't. And then you get a tumor. So immunotherapy is basically using your immune system somehow to fight cancer cells. And so the cytotoxic lymphocytes we talked about, those natural killer cells, and then the antibodies. Activating receptors make the T cells more active. Inhibitory receptors prevent them from working. And those are actually a good thing, because if our T cells recognized our own body cells, then they would attack us, and that would be very dangerous. Um, or if a mother was pregnant, had a baby inside of her, well, if she attacked that baby with her immune system, that could be dangerous. So we have to have a mechanism to shut down T cells when we don't want them to damage something. BCMA, or B cell maturation antigen, is a uh, protein on the surface of myeloma cells. It's on some B cells, but it's particularly prominent on myeloma cells, and conveniently is more and more prominent as the myeloma cells become more aggressive. So in the early stages, when it's more of an MGUS and closer to a normal, myeloma, or a normal plasma cell, there's less of it, but then as it becomes more like active disease, you get more of the BCMA. So this makes a really great target and I guess the way you could think about it, and I apologize, I'm, I'm kind of a pacifist like Dr. McHale, but um, another sort of war analogy. Let's say that you were trying to take out an enemy's supply depot, and you didn't want to destroy the school and the hospital and the houses that were nearby. You would want to have a very targeted missile that would seek out the ammunition depot, but would leave all of the other things intact. Because if it wasn't targeted, and it just kind of went for every building that was there, it would wipe out everything. You want it to take out the munitions depot, but you want to leave everything else safe and intact. That, so the BCMA basically is a way for us to target the myeloma cells, take them out, but with very little collateral damage. So 
chimeric antigen receptor T cells, as you've heard, but you can basically genetically modify somebody's own T cells so that they can recognize myeloma cells. So this T cell that has, really doesn't have the ability to fight the myeloma cells, otherwise they probably really wouldn't be there, you can modify them so that they now recognize this specific marker, the B-cell maturation antigen on the myeloma cell, and they are now activated to take out that cell. So. Um, I think you already saw the nice little diagram there, um, but this will sound very familiar to anybody who's had an auto transplant. So you go on a machine that collects blood cells, very much like an auto. The difference is instead of collecting those baby blood cells to replace an immune system after high dose chemotherapy, you're actually collecting these T cells preferentially because you want to be able to genetically engineer them and then multiply them to put back in the body. So I, I'm a, I, I will admit it, I'm a little bit of a superhero movie junkie. So this is from Captain America. There is no Captain Canada, otherwise I would have used that. But this is from Captain America. So you know, they got the poor little scrawny sick guy with all the health problems and the asthma and can barely lift up his own weight. And then he undergoes this magical process, goes in the machine, and out he comes, and I think it turned out rather well. <laughs> <coughs> so, <laughs> thank you. Um, so there's the T-cells before the genetic engineering, that's the T-cells after the genetic engineering. Thank you, Captain America. So just to reiterate, so you collect the stems, the T-cells, sorry, the white blood cells from the, from the circulation and isolate the T-cells and activate, divide them. So you've got more T-cells to work with. You use this inactive viral vector. Inactive is in this virus, when you use this viral vector, you're choosing one that's not going to cause an infection in the person. Because of course, if you tell somebody you're gonna stick T cells in their body that have been infected with a virus, that sounds kind of terrifying. This is a virus that's not going to hurt them. The only thing it's going to do is to install a new gene in that T cell's DNA. And then you get this expression of this um, chimeric antigen receptor that targets this, this antigen that's specific to the B cell. You multiply them in the lab, and then they get some chemotherapy treatment to kind of drop down the normal lymphocytes in the blood while you give these T cells back. Um, now, I, I'm putting this up not so you can try to memorize this whole list of things, but it's just to say this comes at a cost. It sounds like this is a fantastic idea because you give somebody back their own cells, well then you don't have to worry about all that reaction that you might get if you gave them somebody else's cells. Well actually, because you're giving them this great big load of T cells that are quite active, there's a cytokine release syndrome, and it's actually quite scary. And this is why CAR T cell therapy will only ever be done in centers that can handle it. Probably places that have experienced transplanters, very active and involved uh, intensive care units because you can get extremely sick in the first while after you get these T cells back. So you can see all of those symptoms you can get, like big long list, and the treatment list looks even longer. So the cytokine release syndrome is very, very important and signif significant. <coughs> Um, then you can get these neurologic symptoms which can actually go to the point of seizures. So uh, some people end up on anti-seizure medication for a time and tumor lysis syndrome. Of course, these are very effective cells, but if they kill all the myeloma cells at once, that can release so many poisons into the circulation, the body can't clear it quickly. So these are very significant side effects. They require very close uh, management and monitoring. So it's, it's great, no denying it's a great therapy, but there's, like with everything, there's a cost. So just uh, in, in, uh, to fi finish now, I'm going to talk about a couple of trials and uh, the results that they have shown so far in using this CAR T cell therapy. So uh, the BB2121 uh, trial, um, named for Bluebird Bio, I believe is the, the biotech company that developed it, um, they basically did a, a, a phase one where they did a dose escalation trial. Thank you. I had influenza on New Year's Eve, and literally, this is what I've been like ever since. So, it's a bad karma I'm paying off or something. <clears throat> so, the, uh, the phase one trial, basically, they were escalating the dose of the number of cells that they gave back. This is pretty standard with any drug. Start with a little bit, make sure it doesn't make people too sick, give them more, and give them more. And they never really hit a, a dose limiting toxicity, as in they went, were able to go to the highest dose that they planned without it becoming too toxic. 
And what was very interesting about this um, was the response rate. So an overall response rate of 94% and 89% received a VGPR or greater. And they actually did this minimal residual disease monitoring we talked a bit about previously, and uh, that patients actually had some MRD negativity. But if you look at the patients that were involved in this study, they had an average of about seven prior treatments. These are patients who had had a lot of treatment, fantastic treatment, lenalidomide, carfilzomib, daratumumab. They'd had great treatment and had progressed on the treatment. Almost half of them had high-risk disease. We talked about it quite a lot yesterday, high-risk disease, difficult to treat. And these patients actually had responses, some of them. Um, now, there were some people who passed away, some of progressive disease, but to see response rates like this is really quite astonishing in these patients that shouldn't be responding well to anything. So it's early, but exciting. And so the global phase two trial is open for enrollment. I'm not aware of any Canadian centers. I think it's mostly US and Europe right now. Correct me if anybody knows otherwise, though. Um, so then this BC, uh, BCMA, are there other ways that we can target it that actually don't involve the CAR T cells? And actually, there are. So conjugated antibodies are not new. Um, conjugated antibody basically means you have an antibody and you stick something else onto it. So chemotherapy, old-fashioned chemotherapy, is basically like aiming a giant shotgun at the body and just shooting the body with it and hoping the cancer cells die more than everything else. It's roughly what broad spectrum chemotherapy is like. So if you can target that so that the only thing really getting damaged is the cancer cell, that's obviously better. So you can take an antibody and stick chemotherapy on it, and the chemotherapy kills the, the cell that that antibody is, is against. Uh, you can stick radiation to it, so a radioisotope. Then it's like delivering radiation right to the cancer cell. Um, you can deliver a toxin, so diphtheria toxin has actually been used. They stick it to an antibody, it kills that cell, not the stuff around it. So it's not a new um, idea and has, is already in use in some cancers. So what they do is this particular antibody is specific for BCMA and it can re recruit these effector cells that can target even the non-dividing cells. Most chemotherapy really just picks out the dividing cells. This can target the non-dividing cells. And you don't want the drug to be active in the circulation. You want it to become active when it hits the cancer cell. And that's what this little group is designed to prevent. So there's this little group onto it. Then you get it onto the cancer cell. And it can actually, this, this chemotherapy type treatment can actually be toxic to the myeloma cell. So this study, um, this uh, abstract is from ASH, December of 2017, so recently as well. Um, and these, again, relapsed and refractory myeloma patients had had at least three drug classes, and many of them had had, again, very potent, very active therapy, and had progressed fairly recently on their therapy. And they had to have disease that was clearly progressing. And this was, again, same idea. You're trying to, this is an early study. You're trying to see, can we give it safely? How much can people handle? What's the maximum dose that we can give without it becoming too dangerous? And they wanted to see, are people responding to it? How does it work? Do people develop antibodies? You can actually develop antibodies against these uh, new treatments, and that can be an issue. And so again, they had a dose escalation. They tried a dose and then went up and then went up. And their maximum dose was close to actually the top of the planned dosing, 3.4 milligrams per kilogram. And basically, uh, the, uh, the uh, part two of the study was you got treatment. And it was just with this antibody treatment. So it wasn't joined on to anything else. It was purely on its own for up to potentially a year. Again, this is patients who have had a lot of treatment, and this is a drug by itself, not in combination with anything else. And the overall response rate was 60%. Now, not all of those responses were equivalent, but at least there was some response there in over half of patients. Again, pretty astonishing for a single agent drug in this population. Um, the vision issues, quite scary from what I've heard speaking to Dr. Trudell, who's from Toronto and was the first author on this paper, um, that the vision was a little bit intimidating um, because it was reversible, but of course vision changes are, are, were, were definitely an issue and some low counts, but otherwise quite well tolerated. And so the part two of the study is, is ongoing. Uh, I believe Toronto's still open. I'm not sure if there's anywhere else in Canada and then several American sites. So, Joe, can you take a couple of questions? 
I can try to take a yep, couple of questions. Yeah, we have some time for questions, and we have a floating mic, so should, you can raise your hand, slower. and we'll try and uh, get over to you with the mic. It's one down. Can you put me? Okay, good. The um, <clears throat> CAR T cell technology, as you described it, sounded so optimistic. I was so pumped up, <laughs> and then um, it sounds like the, um, the the transplant therapy is so prohibitive, like as to make it almost prohibitive. Do you sense any optimism that that part of the procedure <coughs> can be made? easier or because otherwise I don't know where this could go and are you talking the cytokine release syndrome where patients can get quite sick with it I couldn't hear you or, or the, the cytokine release where patients can yeah. get quite sick with the treatment right, you mean yeah. um, it's very difficult to I mean I think there is definitely some you know certainly some uh, research being done as the trials progress I'm, uh, you know people will be looking at ways to make it more tolerable um, but it is a mechanism of the T cells themselves largely. It's the type of cell that you're putting into a body. This isn't just like giving a drug uh, or a substance. You're actually giving living cells into the body. And of course, the joy of that is it's the gift that keeps on giving, really. These cells continue to control the cancer if they work and hopefully will continue for a long time. Uh, but the, the flip side of that is because they are active cells, you get this syndrome uh, along with it. And I think it will be very hard to eliminate that. Now, I mean, the good news is that uh, there's very few fatalities with it, as bad as it sounds, because the patients who receive a, a CAR-T are so closely monitored. And they're, you know, you're not treated outside a center that does not have the capacity to deal with it. It has to be the appropriate specialist. They have to have the appropriate support. Everything is really anticipated. So I, I don't think it will be prohibitive in people who are well, but I do suspect that for people who are maybe not as strong, the CAR-T will not be maybe as, as great an option. But the, everything is so early yet, I think we still have a lot to learn. Um, and other cancer centers in Canada? So I am not aware of anybody in Canada offering CAR T cell therapies right now. Um, the goal would be that that would become available at least on a trial basis at some point. Uh, and certainly we're all anticipating CAR T cells coming, um, but I'm not aware of anybody who is able to offer CAR T right now, are they? Okay, there's a trial. Aldo's correcting me. There's a trial open at Prin uh, Princess Margaret. Okay, so that's not. Yeah, so, so apparently there was a spot that, or one that just opened at Princess Margaret that was given three spots, but three spots only. Um, and to go away for this therapy, just to give you an idea, you know, on average they say, you know, estimate about a million dollars, give or take. Um, to send someone for this therapy to, to say, an American center. So uh, the cost is certainly uh, quite significant. Hi, Deborah. Um, you, the cytokine release syndrome uh, reminds me a little bit of um, the cytokine just triggers in, um, for me, in dentistry, we treat um, the immune system with a low-dose doxycycline for patients with gum disease, periodontal disease. And um, the, lo the low-dose doxycycline works on the immune system, of course, not uh, bacteria in the mouth. So I was just wondering, they must be treating the cytokine release syndrome similarly, I imagine, with medication that works on the immune system to lower the cytokine so um, I don't think I have it up there now. Um, so there's multiple strategies that, that can be used. Um, so there's probably some degree of immunomodulation that will be necessary. There's a lot of supportive care because you get a lot of things like capillary leak syndrome and things like that. So fluid on the lungs that require support for breathing. Um, there, there's a lot of elements that are, are required. I think the, the, the really key thing is going to be can we keep it, damp it down a little bit right from the beginning. And that's what some of that uh, lymphodepletion uh, hopefully will will assist, but the, I think I think the, I just feel like there's still a lot to be learned about the optimal treatment for this for the cytokine release syndrome, and I would imagine that that will evolve. Okay, we have one last question, and I think we had one around here. Oh. 
Um, I've heard a lot about the CAR-T trials in China. And of course, you know, some of them are, have good results, but not necessarily the track record. So that a lot of the American pharmaceuticals are coming on board with them. Is that going to help us or not? Um, if we're interested in looking into CAR T cells. So I th there's a lot of discussion about the best way, I think, to sort of look at CAR T cells. Is it best to, you know, as far as bringing it into Canada, is that what you're asking? Um, to, it's always going to be very expensive, I think, to enlist another country to do CAR T cells because it's going to be, you basically have to collect your patient cells, ship them over, then of course that center is going to have the cost of creating the cells, shipping them back. So that's always going to be probably fairly expensive. Um, I think it would be nice to have the idea of doing it within Canada, but then there's the, uh, you know, also the issues of do you use an existing, um, you know, CAR T cell producer that is, you know, already e existing and has the track record, or do you actually look at trying to develop your own antibodies, you know, but those would have to be proven as well. So I think, I, I don't know how much, you know, it, having different uh, countries on board, obviously more knowledge is better, more experience is better, but what that will directly mean for us, um, I, I don't, I don't know. Early, it's still so early days. I think that's really the, the fundamental thing about CAR T cells and the, actually the, the, the BCMA, the, the uh, antibody, is it's just so early. We, we don't really know exactly where it's all going to go yet. So it's really exciting, but it's early, early days. Thank you.